You are listening to Proof Text, a Glossa House podcast exploring scripture with Dr. T. Michael W. Halcom and Dr. Frederick J. Long. Welcome and enjoy. Hello, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to Proof Text. I'm Fred Long, and I'm here with my good friend, Dr. Michael Halcom. And this is episode 15, uh, 17, actually. I think we're dealing with the verb. The verb, the, the sentence is built around the verb, whether it's present or not. And if it's assumed, the elements are all acting as if it were there. So that we're going we're gonna to spend a lot of time with the verb. So thanks for hanging in there with us. And we're talking about voice. And um, we're going to be talking about passive voice today. And I wanted Michael to really lead off on this. So what's the Greek name for the passive voice? And what is the passive voice? Is it even a legitimate uh, category grammatically? <laughs> yeah, so I mean, this is a topic for debate. Um, but so the pathe diathesis or pathetike diathesis, and, um, you know, a, a lot of point of Greek scholars, if you were to look in the grammars, they're going to denote the this thing they call the passive voice by the theta eta marker for example, but uh, the reality is when you look at that theta eta um, sort of diachronically across time, what you see is that uh, it isn't necessarily shifting uh, to become a passive voice because uh, that theta eta is found in a lot of uh, situations where the context isn't passive at all. So the Um, theta eta is traditionally what students learn as the sixth principal part where the future passive and the aorist passive forms are found. So just so you, some of you who are listening have a context. So Michael's talking about the fact that this theta eta formation is used in context when it doesn't have a passive meaning. So that begs the question, what is it then? If it's not really marking passiveness, what is it marking? And so how how do you explain that, Michael? Yeah, so when I'm teaching this, um, we're dealing with theta eta. Is I teach that it, like in the previous episode, if folks listened, you talked about um, the beneficial middle, the reflexive function of the middle, the reciprocal function of the middle, and so I describe this as the passive function of the middle voice, right? Mm-hmm. So it's okay. if you're thinking about just a drop down list, right? Uh, this is just one of dozen a dozen or more functions of the middle voice um and so that in koine there isn't a passive voice per se but there is a passive function of the middle voice because that's how i'll describe it when i'm teaching it um it still sounds uh, when we when we get it into english when translating into english like passive voice Mm -hmm. Uh, although that's maybe not what's going on under the hood with regard to Greek. And so when you say something like uh, Sam helped Sarah, right? Uh, Or something like, oh, sorry, Sarah was helped by Sam. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, There you have this sort of passive uh, passive functionality taking place. Um, you can probably think of numerous other verbs, but uh, so whereas in English we would call that the passive voice, I would say actually what's happening in Greek is it's just the passive function of the middle voice. I like the idea of of thinking of a spectrum of subject effectiveness, and I know that that that's kind of a big concept, but that the subject is doing something in such a way that the action is coming back to them. So you have you know direct benefit i wash myself in greek that's just the middle voice yeah. but then on the one ex- on the other extreme is you could actually have i am being washed by somebody yeah. else that's the other extreme of subject effectiveness where the subject becomes completely passive but all of Good that example. is under the uh the spectrum the continuum of subject effectiveness so it's just that in in the Greek language, a form developed to to help yeah. mark that more distinctly. But then it's it's it seems like it's better to understand it as a development of the middle 
not as a distinct yeah. thing itself, because the form itself is used in contexts where passiveness is not found. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And so I think uh, there are other ways to get at passiveness, right? Like you go with the genitive. Am I thinking correct? Like maybe not. I don't know. But there are other contexts. Is that right? Like, uh, no, that's instrumentality. Like someone or something is being used. So there are other ways to convey this sort of um, a sense of passiveness without necessarily having um, uh, a verb marker or specific form that does it, right? Sometimes context alone uh, just does it. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. Or the, the verb itself has it baked into it. Yeah. The idea of passive. Yeah. I'm wondering if you're yeah. thinking of the different kind of prepositional phrases that convey that somebody else is the origin or source or the agent of the action. And that can help convey the, you know, that there's a pass, like truly a passive use. I kind of resist the idea of meanings or functions. I don't know. I, I think mm. it's more like a use in context. Like it's a contextual thing, yeah. but um, yes, because a lot of times we 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 look to these grammars or lexicons for functions, and I don't think it's really functions. I think it's a use that is very context dependent. And if it's context dependent, yeah. then we have to really begin to wonder whether the form is truly marking that or not, or is just allowing for a spectrum of uses depending on the context. But that gets us into, you know, some other uh, matters of labeling and over categorization of things, yeah. which we're prone to do in our, our grammars. And I think it can be misleading yeah. to students. This stuff is not as clean as we would like it to be. Yeah, language never is. It's always yeah. complex and, you know, that's because of context. Yeah. <laughs> Um, use in context. That's a good good way to to put it. So, well, thanks. Yeah, those are my thoughts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. thanks, Michael. And uh, we're glad to have you listen to uh, Proof Text and these grammatical points. And uh, please subscribe, share share this with other people. And uh, we're hoping finding these beneficial. Let us know what you think and uh, where where we'll go where we can go next. So we're going to finish the verb. Mm. We're going to go to moods. We'll go to uh, well. There's a lot with the moods. To, to survey the rest of the yeah. moods we could talk about me verbs a little bit and all that kind of stuff so we got aspects still to do but yeah yeah, yeah verbal aspect yeah so nice to uh, have you join us and uh, we'll look forward to having you listen and watch us next time take care interested in growing your ancient language skills but not sure where to start glows house can help from illustrated readers and short stories to lexicons and grammars Glossa House offers a variety of resources for beginning, intermediate, and experienced ancient language learners. Head to glossahouse.com today. Glossa House, language resources for the global community.